Bonjour, j'aimerais commencer par me présenter. Uh, Francis Biodo, I'm the Senior Policy ADM at the Department of ISAD. Um, I was also previously the, the acting GCCIO and then the, the, the Assistant Deputy Minister at TBS uh, for Digital Policy. So in one way or another, I've been uh, connected to the important topic we're talking about today, which is digital ID for a number of years. Bienvenue à la septième activité de la série sur les nouveaux enjeux économiques, un partenariat entre l'École de la fonction publique du Canada et le Centre pour l'innovation euh, dans la gouvernance internationale. Je tiens à mentionner certains points administratifs importants avant de commencer. La traduction simultanée est offerte dans la, la, dans la langue de votre choix par l'entremise du portail. Des directives à cet effet, de même que le texte des exposés aujourd'hui, euh, vous ont été envoyés en même temps que le lien vers la web diffusion. Um, Digital ID uh, has been a topic of discussion within the government of Canada, but also uh, within countries around the world for a number of years. Uh, shaping Canada's digital ID identity landscape is a task shared by many levels of government, as well as external stakeholders like DIAC, uh, private sector organizations. There are many groups around the table who will be key partners for getting it right in Canada. We've assembled what I think is a fantastic panel today, and this should be a really good discussion. Our panelists bring expertise from the private sector and other levels of government, and we can expect them to expand on federal conversations uh, around digital identity in ways that are both complementary and thought-provoking. Um, of note, this panel isn't desi designed to give you the official view of what digital ID is, should be for the government of Canada, but rather to expose public servants to some leading thinkers from other levels of government, business, industry, and representative associations. First, let's, let's talk a little bit about what, uh, what we mean by identity and what we mean by digital identity. At a very basic level, we all understand the, the concept of identity. Uh, we're born and our parents give us, uh, give us names so that, they, so that when they call out to us, uh, they know, we know that they're talking to us. Uh, at the same time, we're given one of our first uh, government issues identity uh, in the form of a birth, uh, birth certificate. Um, later on, uh, we... we uh, start accumulating other types of ideas, th ideas, things like our passports uh, that allow us to travel or our driver's license that allow us to, for example, get into a bar. Uh, some of you may have even experimented or seen people experiment with uh, early sort of forms of identity fraud by using a, a fake ID to get into a bar. Um, so in some ways, uh, we've, we've uh, been around identity for all of our lives and they've been an important part of our life that we don't always think about. Um, but more and more, as we move into a digital age, the, the, we are moving from paper-based identity uh, to electronic forms. Uh, you're accessing your banks online by using a password. You may have bought a coffee recently by using uh, a form of biometric uh, assurance and using your, your iPhone to pay for your coffee. Um, some, some of the transactions you're doing might not be very sensitive. Uh, for example, if you are reserving uh, a camping site uh, and not having to pay for it through, through the uh, Parks Canada website. Others require a more important level of assurance and the consequences of identity fraud can have serious repercussions. And so as more and more of the interactions between government are moving online, the capacity uh, to identify and validate an individual's identity electronically is becoming increasingly important. Uh, this is an issue for governments around the world, there are some nations already having well-established national digital ID, ID ecosystems. The GOC and the government of Canada has been making efforts in this space, uh, and I would venture to say developing what we can consider to be a Canadian approach that's anchored in our own federal reality. I'm sure you'll hear more about this from some of our panelists. Um, for, for many countries, a sound approach to digital ID identity is a foundational platform to moving the interactions between government and individuals to the digital reality that reflects the expectations of citizens in the 21st century. Today, we have the benefit of being able to engage in conversation with some leading experts in the field of digital identity, and I look forward to the conversation. Um, introducing our panelists, I would uh, first introduce uh, Joni Brennan. Joni is the president of Digital ID and Authentication Council of Canada, or DIAC. She's more than 15 years of experience in digital identity innovations and standards development. Today, she's driving the development uh, of an identity trust framework, contributing to international committees and standards organizations, and building strategic partnerships across the public and private sector. 
Next, Col uh, Colleen Bolden. Colleen is the Director of Digital Lab and Digital ID Programs with Service New Brunswick. Colleen has a long career in information technology and experience in private sector, academia, and government. Currently, Colleen is responsible for digital identity programs uh, with Service New Brunswick and is leading efforts on the Smart Province Initiative to leverage technologies to accelerate the integration, development, and growth of digital solutions in the public sector. And next, I'd like uh, Colleen, and next I'd like to introduce Debbie Gamble. Uh, Debbie is the Chief uh, Officer of Innovation Labs and New Ventures at Interac. Uh, Debbie's work focuses on mobile commerce, digital identity, uh, and cryptocurrency uh, solutions. She's recognized as a leading authority in the digital economy and has been widely recognized for her work in the fintech sector. And last but not least, I'd like to in introduce Andre Boyson. Uh, Andre is the Chief Identity Officer at SecureKey and a senior, senior fellow at, at CIGI. He's recognized as a global leader in digital identity, privacy, digital transformation, and blockchain. Andre is an active contributor to the digital identity community and serves on the boards of identity standards organizations such as DIAC uh, and the, the Cantera Initiative. Um, the panel today, so just a note that the panel will be using WooClap uh, to pose a few questions to the audience and to receive your questions towards the end of the event. Uh, the instructions to access WooClap were sent to you uh, to your email and so and also appear on screen. The access code is JAN12, so uh, J-A-N-12, all capitals. And why don't we uh, warm up with a first question on WooClap. Um, and the first question we'll, we'll ask to, to all our uh, participants to get to know you a little bit is, how familiar are you with digital identity? Connaissez-vous bien l'identité numérique? So your options are very, somewhat, a little, or, or none at all, and we'll be looking to learn a little bit more about you. And so we see the results are moving a little bit. But we see we have a small portion of the uh, of the audience that is that says they know quite a lot. Uh, the vast majority are saying they know quelque peu ou un peu, uh, and a, and a small portion don't know about digital identity at all. So context for our panel members uh, today: uh, we we have an audience that that varies quite a bit in terms of its understanding from. Uh, the quite a lot to the not at all with the with the majority of our participants today having some notion of, of digital identity uh, but looking to to enhance the knowledge um, so with that we'll move straight to the the presentations uh, and our first present presenter will be Joan Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, and thank to all of you for participating in this important discussion today. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, um, as the slides are getting pulled up, I also am thrilled to uh, that we have um, in this panel today, not only the um, experience that was discussed, uh, we also represent uh, from Canada one coast to the other. So good morning to all of you from the early morning here in Vancouver. Um, and we've got Colleen uh, Bolden out in New Brunswick on the other end of the country. So it's a real thrill to have that coverage. Um, so I think you folks are going to put up my first slide. So you can do that as soon as you're ready. Great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start by covering what identity is and uh, in a broad brush brought with broad brush strokes and really focus on one of the top priorities here about the why of identity. And that is really on the economic impacts that, I, that solving digital identity can bring to Canada. And so uh, there have been numerous studies that have been done around the world. And generally we find that there is around three to 6% of GDP that can be gained and realized into the Canadian economy by solving for the ability to verify people and organizations and relationships in between. How's that made up? It's made up through fraud reduction, through increased efficiencies and through opportunities um, to create new and compelling services that all Canadians need to be able to use, whether they're in the busy bustling cities or in the rural uh, landscapes of Canada. So the economic opportunity here is massive. That's especially important when we need to get Canadians 
things back to work and, and reopen the economy and keep the economy moving in times such as these with the global pandemic that we're working through. Next slide, please. Um, and so in order to make this vision a reality, Canadians need to know what data exists about them and citizens, governments and businesses, they need tools to help people to manage proper sharing and verification of that information. Next slide. Now, um, it was great to hear the, the, the level of understanding that folks have with identity today and, and the concepts. And so uh, we went out last year and um, actually this is some 2019 data. We asked, we asked Canadians what they thought about um, digital identity. And so let's go through what, what Canadians thought um, about digital identity. Um, well, uh, Canadians had some concerns about digital identity and particularly uh, we're missing one slide here but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to it anyway um, what Canadians were looking for is uh, they do have concerns about using social media so only 30% trusted social media um, sites to protect data about them now can, what Canadians did have trust in was 83% said that they trusted governments to protect data about them followed very closely by 81% who said that they trusted financial institutions to protect and manage data about them. So we have some strong foundations here um, for, for building solutions and services on top of institutions such as government and financial institutions and financial services. So let's talk about what does identity look like today? Um, next slide, please. Well, um, what identity looks like today really is that on the internet, um, we like to say that on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog, which I think is a, a really good example of how the internet and identity behaves today. It's hard to prove that you are a dog. It's hard to prove that you're not a dog. Um, and so we need ways to be able to verify people. So let's go through some key challenges here and, and put the next pieces of the slide up. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the key challenges that we have for, for, for around the digital identity space and moving it forward. Um, particularly, we need the right market conditions to help create the ecosystem and the space to enable digital identity to move forward. And so specifically, we're talking about standards, uh, the standards development space. Standards are not the solution for digital identity. They are tools to help solve digital identity move forward. forward. And so there's important work being done to normalize and bring standards together, both from the Canadian perspective. And when we look at solving identity, well, the internet doesn't stop at the Canadian borders. And so we need to be working in the global ecosystem for how we solve for digital identity. Um, and then another area that needs to move forward and, and and, 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 and innovate, let's say, is um, around the regulatory scheme. So we have some really strong foundations here, again, um, in terms of um, security practices, in terms of know your customer and anti-money laundering in the financial sector, um, as far as regulated industries. And so um, we know that there, need, there we believe that there are some regulatory changes that our policies could benefit from um, to both um, enable digital uh, solutions that work for Canadians and, and as well as reduce barriers for participation. So there's strong work that needs to be done there um, across the board. Um, next build on this slide, please. Um, and then also promoting the right market growth. And so when we're looking at how digital identity moves forward, some of the things I'll ask you to look at and think about are, what are the sustainability? How are the how are these solutions and services for digital identity sustained? Are they solutions and services that are fully inside of the public sector, funded through public sector means and sustainable through public sector means? That's one path path forward for sure. Um, and we might have an ecosystem as well with some commercial aspects for how that ecosystem is funded, whether consumers and citizens are funding there or whether we have private sector entities who are gaining value funding through those. And so there's no single model in terms of sustainability. And so you should look at when you're looking at these systems, different kinds of ways of these systems would be sustainable. Um, and last but absolutely not least, inclusion. So we have to ensure that we have the right inclusion in these ecosystems. So Next slide, please. Um, what this ecosystem looks like, and I think there are a couple of builds that you can do here for some for some pink bubbles. Um, but what this sli slide really talks about is you should think about this ecosystem as organizations that are requesting data to be verified and organizations, organizations that can verify that data. Now, what's most important here is you. You're in the middle. And so this means that you provide the consent, you provide the, uh, the permission for these organizations to both um, uh, connect with each other in a sense to be able to verify data about you in a secure, private, and ethical way. Next slide, please. 
and you can keep going. There's a few bubbles. These are the kinds of data, your address, your income, your date of birth. So these are the kinds of data you might want verified. Thank you. Next slide, please. Perfect. Um, so where is the, some of this work happening? Uh, there is a um, the organization that I work for is the Digital ID and Authentication Council of Canada. We're a not-for-profit organization. Um, when we're outside of Canada, people tend to get confused and think we're, we're representing government. When we're inside of Canada, people think we solely represent the private sector. Neither of those are the case. We actually are a collaborative of public and private sector entities who believe that the best way forward is to work together here. Um, so if you'd like to get involved, we'd be happy to speak with you. Next slide, please. Um, and so that's the work that we're doing now. Uh, the I would say that if you're interested in this space, something that you'll probably hear a bit about today is the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework. This is a framework that points out to the different kinds of standards and practices that are required for digital identity. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, I'm excited today to share the, the virtual stage with this panel and talk about some of the high level concepts of identity and where and how we can work together, public and private, a federal, provincial, municipal, territorial, um, to move this space forward in a way that works for all Canadians. Thanks so much for joining us today, and I look forward to this discussion. Thanks, Julia. That was great and very useful. So from the perspective of a national uh, collaborative to the provincial perspective, um, why don't we move to, to, co to Colleen now? Hi folks, Colleen Bolden uh, from New Brunswick. I represent uh, Service New Brunswick and um, uh, I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit about Service New Brunswick. We're a Crown Corp. We were set up probably about 10 years ago uh, and many mergers later we are the shared services organization for the department or for the province of New Brunswick. Uh, so we do everything from IT and servers and uh, applications right through to laundry and our service centers uh, in all the regions. Um, this set us up well for digital. Um, like every other province, we also have a digital strategy. Um, in most provinces, you could just Google that and see it. I know most of you are um, uh, in Ontario, uh, and certainly Ontario's new digital strategy uh, onwards um, is uh, has gotten a lot of press lately. So you'll be able to find all of that. But I want to focus on dig on smart and the smart province initiative that digital identity was announced about five years ago. Uh, and we went through a proof of concept and a production pilot, uh, as well as naming it um, what it meant to us. So uh, SMART, the term SMART comes from Gartner. Many of you would uh, know about Gartner. And uh, to Gartner, it is the highest level of maturity, uh, digital maturity, where you're uh, telling the tell us once approach is predominant. So you provide your information once and it's shared across various applications. Um, it's also about interconnected jurisdictions, as well as um, interconnected connected within your own province. Um, so it's very, very different than uh, just an e-form that you fill in online and potentially just have to print. It is the highest level of digital maturity. Uh, in New Brunswick, we went to Estonia, uh, prompted uh, by private sector to go take a look at digital and how that might move the province's economic strategy forward. So that's the backdrop for SMART. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what, what's in that vision for New Brunswick, uh, the work of joint councils, the federal government, the policy gaps, and the collaborative roadmap. Next slide, please. So uh, could you go back one? So in New Brunswick, we called it My ID. So it's a trusted digital identity, which is used to do things online that represents you as securely as if you were standing in front of me at a service center uh, asking to do particular uh, service, uh, like renew your driver's license. Um, next slide. So what we looked at is I am who I say I am. And if for many of you who uh, know that 
anything about digital identity, that's a common uh, way to describe it. I am who I say I am. You know, Wendy's standing at the counter or Wendy's coming on online. Wendy is who she say, says she is. It's a single source for New Brunswick citizen identification. It does mean we have to re-engineer and leverage current systems because we do not have the luxury of throwing out our legacy systems. Um, and every government would be in that same boat. However, Estonia, the po po poster child for uh, digital economy, uh, was able to start from scratch when they uh, broke off from the uh, uh, Russian uh, government. So we need to develop architectures built obviously on a very strong match between privacy and security and built to pan-Canadian standards. Next slide, please. At the national level, um, it's all about uh, collaborating together, sharing lessons learned, respect obviously for privacy and security and client choice as uh, Joni mentioned, but governments have a key role because we hold foundational evidence of identity. So in provinces and territories, that's our vital statistics registries. It's proof of citizenship. For immigrants, it's held in IRCC and those uh, immigration papers that prove they're a Canadian citizen or a landed immigrant. Um, and uh, for the highest level of uh, trust, we need to prove citizenship because that matters to Canadians and our confederation gives rights and freedoms based on citizenship. Um, obviously we need to collaborate uh, and it's, it's not gonna happen overnight uh, folks, this really is a marathon, uh, not a sprint. Um, we have to be able to issue credentials and trust um, that um, we can use them across uh, individual governments, but also I need to be able to trust something issued by BC or uh, vice versa. New Brunswick credentials need to be trusted by um, other provinces. Um, and then by extension across other sectors and then internationally. And the work internationally is being done through the federal government and the digital nations, but also through a lot of the standards bodies that uh, are collaborating to help set up these ecosystems. Next slide. Here's a, a slide from my uh, partners at uh, Treasury Board. Um, so you can see the federal government vision has always been to accept identity from the provinces. And also uh, EIDAS on the right hand side, that's the uh, European Union standard and there are many others. Uh, obviously banks and telcos play into this. And it's all about um, finding a way to trust each other's credentials and ensure the right level um, of proofs are presented for highly sensitive uh, transactions. Next slide. So you're hearing a lot about hacking. So why is identity a key enabler and what's changed on the perimeter? Um, if you wouldn't mind tapping one more time. Thank you. Um, so we used to be able to just put a firewall around it and everything was on site. And now that's not the case. Most of you are working from home. Uh, you're using mobile devices. Things have migrated to the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. You have partners at the table, vendors, contractors. And all of these endpoints have different requirements and tools to keep them secure. So as part of a cybersecurity practice, there are many, many ways um, uh, and tools being deployed to protect end users and corporate systems. Digital identity is one of those. So you've probably heard about multi-factor authentication, which is basically using more than one way to authenticate somebody coming in. Or you've probably heard of single sign-on, which is just you know uh, a username. So today we didn't actually have to use a password to come in. It was a single single factor sign-on. But there are many ways to protect. Digital identity ties you to foundational evidence of identity. Uh, it might tie you to driver's license. It might tie you to other things um, that prove your you coming in. And then using the standards approach, um, we can tighten it up to match the level of sensitivity to the transaction coming on. Um, next slide. What's happening? So technology obviously is moving really, really rapidly and um, individuals um, have adapted quite well 
Um, but we all recognize the rapid disruptive changes going on. Businesses tend to take a little longer. Public policy is longer again. Um, so I would challenge each of you in your lines of business, you know your lines of business, you know your clientele, how can you use policy updates and modernizations for this new digital world? How can you help businesses and citizens and your clients adjust to this rapid change? And more importantly, leverage it to create new innovation, new GDP models, um, and really um, increase privacy and security. Uh, but it also allows you uh, to increase uh, throughput, uh, efficiencies, uh, faster service delivery, and ultimately happier clientele. One of the things that we've been able to do uh, through collaboration at the national level is we have the uh, White House uh, Declaration, which was done by the clerks. Um, and in some of the materials you'll get, you'll see the link to GitHub on that. And that was in a, a signed by all clerks to collaborate on uh, this new world of digital identity and uh, no province or jurisdiction left behind. We also created the first uh, public policy document that uh, was drafted to look at roles and responsibilities. Um, your federal government uh, has the digital charter uh, along with work going on to make that, uh, was brought into the house to make it a bill uh, and many, many policy instruments there. Um, with the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework, both Alberta and BC have gone through the first reviews uh, around their digital identity um, credentials uh, to allow um, those trusted identity credentials to be accepted by the federal government. And finally, um, at joint councils, this file is so important, it's seen as one of the top things that can improve service delivery to Canadians and businesses. So um, uh, an individual was hired and sourced by uh, joint councils, and that person will focus on digital identity. So lots and lots of work that has gone on. The public sector profile has been done uh, to ensure that uh, credentials accepted by uh, public entities can uh, be trusted and what level of assurance. So all of these are progress. Um, next slide, please. So the roadmap at the national level is really about communications. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of collaboration. Uh, we share pilots, we share lessons learned, we look at what has happened, what we've learned, how it can be leveraged in other jurisdictions. Obviously, the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework is incredibly important. Uh, the public sector profile uh, work at the federal level was led by Treasury Board, and that fed into the Standards Council of Canada and the DIAC work. Um, technology continues to be disruptive and changing. But technology really is the easy part of this very, very complex file. Uh, policy and governance are key. Um, and you can see the partners at the table. So again, it's all about collaboration. Um, my colleagues across the country are all working on this and road mapping it. And there really is great uh, collaboration between all levels of government in Canada, but also through the federal government into international uh, areas of expertise. So that's it. Thanks so much, Colleen. So going from a uh, perspective of a national organization now to the perspective of, of somebody uh, delivering for a provincial government, we'll move to our, our private sector participants who are helping to shape the technology and the implementation of this. We'll start with uh, uh, Debbie Gamble. And Debbie, over to you. Thanks, Francis. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, you, you might wonder what Canada's uh, national payment uh, system is doing talking about digital identity. Um, and I think, you know, some of the themes that you've, you've heard this morning already are very key to us at Interac. Um, so we've heard about, you know, the necessity for a, a Canadian digital identity set of capabilities, um, the necessity for collaboration, um, the importance of standards as we move forward on this. And if you, I'd like you to think about um, the role of companies like Interac, and, and we'll hear from Andre and, and uh, SecureKey in a second. But when you think about 
uh, the path forward for digital ID and certainly the path for digital ID as it relates to our economy. Um, I'd encourage you to think about it as a journey around establishing that network, uh, ultimately a network of networks. Um, so as uh, Interac have been a key player in the payments industry in Canada for uh, over 30 years, uh, seven years, we know a little bit about how to evolve a network um, and how to engage ecosystem players across the country uh, in that collaborative effort. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, some key themes that, that you will hear us uh, repeat throughout this morning's session is um, the importance of, of digital ID um, and why it matters, not just to, um, you know, a particular segment of the country, but to industries and to businesses across Canada and to each of us as individuals. Um, the reality of the pandemic over the last 10 months or so has um, really accelerated the focus on the digitization of our day-to-day -day lives and the necessity for uh, digital, secure digital capabilities, including digital ID for us to continue to work, to interact as a society and to ultimately create prosperity across Canada. Um, but it's not just about this creation of secure engagement for individuals. Um, it is certainly to be able to prove I am who I say I am, as, as Colleen just mentioned, but it also is necessary for us to think about a secure ecosystem that we can trust as it relates to being able to secure relationships of entities to entities, and that includes um, machine to machine. So it is also about things, uh, ultimately IoT, um, uh, and also the delivering a convenient set of, of capabilities that are secure to allow Canadians to go about their day-to-day -day business. Next slide, please. So our current state, of course, we are relying on analog processes in many cases. And one of the key challenges for us as we're on this digital ID journey is um, kind of how do we enable and onboard people at the start of those digital journeys? We might uh, hear a little bit more about that throughout this morning. Um, but our current processes really do rely on that analog, in many cases, face-to-face -face experience of getting those credentials that we need to prove who we are and to go about our business. Um, many of the social networks, as you know, have created a convenient way to um, create identities, but these are not credentials that are secure enough for us to conduct businesses. So that what Canadians are really looking for, um, as Joni mentioned in some of the uh, survey work that DIAC has done, and then I'll touch on some of the work that we've done at Interac, is Canadians are looking for secure ways of engaging um, in a day-to-day -day manner in a digital experience. So part of the journey that we are embracing is how can we work best together? How do we embrace the appropriate standards and collaborate to actually create that secure, convenient experience? Next slide, please. As Joni mentioned earlier, of course, um, this is critical to the vibrancy of our economy. Um, and as we become increasingly digital, um, it is all about engaging with each other in a digital form and that kind of data economy. So it's about privacy. We've got to consider these conversations, not just around the digital identity, but it actually will um, morph into how we authenticate data, how we authenticate each other, and how we share 
data and we need a common set of standards and policies um, to be able to ensure that whatever innovation is going on across the country, that we can maximize that for the greater good. Um, and that requires us to have a balanced approach. So it most definitely means that we have to embrace those standards, but it also means that um, we need a pro set of processes for us to engage in those standards to actually deliver on the promise of the new digital economy. Next slide, please. So, of course, um, you'd expect uh, somebody from the private sector to talk about why the private sector needs to be involved in these conversations. Um, this absolutely needs to be a collaborative effort across the ecosystem, uh, across ecosystems and allow us to bridge those capabilities. Um, and we need a common set of services for us to be able to accelerate um, the promise of new business engagement, new business models, uh, new ways of digitizing the services that we offer to the marketplace. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the role that we have played at Interact over the past uh, three decades or so around building a network. So one of the things that I think is going to be important for today's conversation is how do we actually, once we've kind of solidified the standards approach, how do we embrace those standards? How do we engage across the country, across businesses? How do we ensure that that approach is inclusive? Um, and how do we ensure that it, it is governed efficiently so we can, it can continue to grow? Next slide, please. When we look at um, the world of digital ID in, at Interact, it really does touch on some, some key um, initiatives across the country as it relates to our business. Um, so payments, of course, you know, the uh, efforts around payment modernization across Canada, the efforts around data portability, um, data privacy, and even how do we take those analog experiences and move them to a digital form as we're grappling with our new normal um, around the pandemic. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we really need to champion digital ID as a catalyst to enable these new ways of interacting. Next slide, please. So uh, we've also done a, a number of uh, surveys over the past couple of years. Um, uh, there's a snapshot here. I'm not going to go through too much of this, but our research shows that, as, as Joni mentioned, um, Canadians see the opportunity, they see the benefits, but they're also concerned around security uh, issues. So we've got work to do around education. Um, next slide, please. If you're interested in, in um, some of this data, we are more than happy to share this. You can go to developer.interact.ca or newsroom.interact.ca for more information. I'd encourage you to um, go to DIAC. We are also um, members of DIAC to be able to get more of that information. Um, and we are happy to engage in conversations as this, uh, as this discussion progresses. Thanks. Thank you, Debbie. A uh, really interesting presentation. And now, last but not least, uh, I would ask for Andre to, to move forward with his presentation. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, merci uh, à tous pour votre attention aujourd'hui. Je suis Andre Boyson. I want to talk about a service that we already have that's in market today, something you may be familiar with called Verified Me. Verified Me is an example of a digital identity network that Joni, Debbie, and Colleen have already been talking about. Many of you will be familiar with the first generation of service used by GC that was called Secure Key Concierge that is now called the government sign-in by Verified Me. The first generation of service was a simple way for Canadians to access online government services using their bank login credentials as a convenience rather than having to remember a user ID and password that maybe they only use once or twice a year. The service has been operating now for eight years and has over 17 million login credentials used by Canadians. It has also saved GC a lot of money over the prior generation of service. Verified Me takes the Secure Key Concierge service concept a little bit further allow, to allow you to prove who you are at online destinations that you choose. When you think about your own life, 
you recognize that you can't sign up for many services online. You can't get a new bank account. You can't get a new cell phone. You can't see your healthcare records, renew your driver's license or your passport. We can't do these things online because it's too risky. There's no way for the online service to know if it's really you. So we force people to come to a counter on the first visit so you can present your documents in person. This is what Verified Me is designed to do, is to take what we do in person that we know and understand and make it work digitally. To make it easy for you to sign up for these new services when you choose to, while also making it trustworthy and cost-effective for business, for all types of businesses, including government services. Importantly, it also has triple blind privacy to give Canadians confidence that limit how their information is being used. Triple blind privacy means when I use my bank account information to prove who I am online, the bank doesn't get to see who I gave the information to. And the service who receives the information, the government, the bank, telco, and health care, and so on, they know the information came from a trusted source, but not who provided it. In our network, which operates the service, we don't know who you are. So what this means is not the bank, not the government, and not the, the service got to see a complete picture of the user journey. And is this privacy model that's been so, so, so successful in making Secure Key Concierge successful to date. And it's designed for Canadians to work across the economy using the Pan-Canadian Trust Framework that Joni, Debbie, and Colleen have already been talking about. Next slide, please. So this picture explains how identity works in person today and uses it as a template for how we want to make digital services online better. The first thing to notice is that the bubbles on the left and on the right. On the left is a list of organizations that I already have a relationship with. And on the right are new places I want to obtain services, but I don't yet have. The pattern that we use today is I use the stuff that I have on the left, government documents, banking statements, utility bills, and so on, to get the new things that I want that are on the right-hand side. The second thing to notice is that it takes a village, as Francois said earlier, as trusted providers to make digital identity work. There is no single organization that solves the problem, and it is me, the user, in control of what documents to share. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I want to do is actually let, let's compare the existing in-person experience and figure out what can be done to make the online service experience better. So, oops. Um, can we go back one slide? I apologize. So what's important here is, you know, when you think about the in-person experience that we have today, what's important is that the destinations make the rules. Every online service makes its own set of rules, what you must have in order to get access to the thing that you want. But you as a user choose what documents want to present. So when you come, perhaps you bring a passport and a bank statement. When I come, I choose to bring a driver's license and utility bill. Both of those are valid choices. And what you also see in this is that there's a plurality of providers. So each of us can show up with different things and still be successful to get what we want. And there is some privacy in this model. When I use my driver's license or a bank statement to prove who I am at a government service counter, the, the source of the documents doesn't get to see who I gave the information to. That's a good model. And we want to keep that as we move forward. And it's already common business practice. Both users and businesses understand this model. Some of the things we want to overcome or fix as we get to digital identity, however, is we want to fix the problem of the oversharing of data. When I share my driver's license to prove my age as an example, they're getting way more information than I need. And if I'm using my bank statements to prove that I've lived in a province for several months, what they really wanted to know that I've actually have a living footprint in my province and they didn't really want to troll through all of my banking details. And so we're oversharing data in those examples. And there's a document integrity challenge that we have today as well. When I present documents at a counter, the service counter has no way to know if the documents are real. You'll look at them and you'll examine them to see if they're internally consistent and if there's any obvious signs of fake fakery going on. But in the end, if it's a, a well-forged document, you're really defenseless against that type of attack. So we want to fix that problem. And lastly, we want to make sure that it works uh, everywhere I go as a user. So it's got to work in person. It's got to work online. It's got to work at the call center too. Uh, next slide, please. So we've already heard Joni speak on the collaboration already happening in Canada between public and private sector and organizations on the digital identity file. In fact, each of the panelist organizations are active contributors at DIAC to bring trusted digital identity to life. And as Joni talked about, there are many organizations working together to make this happen across Canada. Canadians want and expect governments and businesses to work together to make online services easier and more trustworthy for Canadians. Next slide, please. And so this is an updated version of the 
file that, or sorry, picture I just showed you. So this is the digital version of how we share documents. On the left, we have identity providers or relationships that I already have, trusted relationships that I've already gone through a registration process. And I wanna use that information to share somewhere new to get something new that I want. In this fictional example that we have on the screen, I'm, I'm going to a sharing economy app, Millennial Apartments. And so I wanna prove who I am because I'm trying to sign up for a new flat. And so here's an example of how the flow would work. I start with the Millennial apps on the left. And the very first thing that happens if I want to prove who I am is verified me asks you to log in and prove who you are with your bank. And we're just doing this to prove it's you who's accessing the service. And then in the third panel at the bottom, and then you'll see Millennial Apartments is the thing that wants some information about you. And in the lower part of the screen, you'll see there's some detailed information they want. They want to see your bank profile, your name and address information. They want to see some information from your credit score. They might want to verify your government issued ID as well as verify your cell phone number. So if you're curious, you can click on those things to see exactly what information they're going to get. And if you're good to share it, then you click on confirm to provide your consent and that information gets shared with Millennial Apartments. And what's good about this is we've been able to do this all digitally now. So it's more convenient for you as a user and importantly for the landlord in this example, is that they know all of the information is real because it's been trusted and verified against the issuer at the time that is being presented. So the information is real and it's being presented by me and not somebody else. Next example, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Here's two examples that I just want to share of what CRA has been doing in its roadmap to, oh, uh, oh there we go, thanks. Here are two examples that I want to kind of go through quickly just to show you how CRA has been roadmapping how it might do use a service like this to provide services online. So in the times of COVID, we've got the Canada Emergency Response Benefit that's being delivered to many Canadians across Canada and the government of Canada has done an amazing job of getting this out more quickly compared to other governments around the world who are also scrambling to provide benefits to, to citizens in, in times of COVID. So one of the challenges we have today is for government is that when we're signing up for emergency response benefits, if it's Andre, you want to get the benefit to Andre quickly and you'll need his bank account details, but you also have to guard against the fact someone pretending to be Andre and redirecting Andre's benefit to a fake bank account. And the challenge today is when a user provides banking information in an online screen and on a web service, it's hard to know who that bank account belongs to. So here's an example of how I could sign up for a service to give government Canada confidence it's really me and that the bank account details really belong to Andre Boyson and not somebody else. So in this example, I can use my bank account to prove my name is Andre Boyson and here are my verified bank details. And by the way, here's my government issued ID claim to show that this is Andre Boyson. So two different sources of identity. And again, this kind of models and picks up on what we already do in person. We use multiple sources of identity to confirm identity when you sign up for a new online service. Let me just show one more example and then I'll conclude. Next slide, please. Here's a different example, a different flow. Maybe I've got a, a, an existing banking relationship, but for whatever reason, I decide I want to have a new credit card from RBC. And so I've decided I want to take advantage of this offer that RBC has sent me. The challenge is I'm a small business owner and it's hard for me to prove my income because my T4 is from self-generated income. So RBC wants to verify my income data before they're going to give me this new credit card. Now I've got a relationship with my bank, so I can use that to help LBC have confidence I'm already inside the banking system. I've gone through a regulated process to prove my identity, but the, the gap here is proving my income. So now that I've used my banking information to prove who I am over at CRA, CRA has got confidence it's me. So now CRA can give me back my verified proof of income from my tax return last year. So I can then in turn take that over to RBC to prove that I am Andre Boyce and here's my verified income as verified by CRA so I can get access to that new credit card I want. So this is an example in the first instance where CRA wants to consume data from a digital identity network. And in this second example I'm showing you now, here's an example where CRA can help me when I wanna go get a new service somewhere else. And with that, I'm gonna conclude. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Andre. 
So a lot to think about, a lot of information provided by, by our speakers today. We really want to get to, to questions from the audience, questions from all of you. We have the benefit of a highly knowledgeable panel. Um, so there'll be a few questions for, from the moderator, but in the meantime, I would ask people uh, to, to access WooClap to be able to, to um, upvote and provide questions you'd like our panelists to, to use. Again, the access code is JAN12, uh, J-A-N-12. Um, and we will move to, uh, to questions from the audience uh, fairly quickly. Um, but first, I, I want to I want to pick up a little bit on something that Andre uh, Andre mentioned, um, which is around the role of the of the uh, digital identity could play in the context of a pandemic. Um, arguably, all the people around this room are uh, are convinced of the value of digital ID. Arguably also, we haven't necessarily done yet the great job of convincing our, our political uh, masters and, and, and ministers of the importance of investing in this. So what is everybody's best sort of 10 second elevator pitch on why this matters, why we should be doing this? And then particularly in the context like today, where we are living through a pandemic, living unprecedented time, how could digital identity uh, and, and a proper digital infrastructure help us deal with, with future uh, situations or future pandemics. I'm going to start and asking by, by Joni to take a first crack at it, then I'll move to Debbie, Andre, and Colleen. Thank you. That's a, a, you know, a good and interesting question. Um, I would say that the uh, any time that you find that you want to do something digitally online by the phone, uh, sorry, by the mobile phone, for example, or on your computer or your, or your tablet, um, when you when you find you can't do it, that's an identity problem. Anytime you find that there's a high value transaction. And so if that's your healthcare information, I think we certainly um, would say that we feel safer doing a remote healthcare visit right now and then going into an office. Um, having one place where we could view our medical records and be able to be more active um, in managing our own healthcare and more supportive as patients in teaming with practitioners and supporting our healthcare. Um, you know, that's a place where identity comes into play. Um, so, so I think that the uh, identity is important for the pandemic. Anytime you would need to verify someone, anytime you would need to also do supply chain tracking and management about how do we even get the vaccine to people? How many people do we need to get it to? Have they had it yet or not? Are they due for their second dose? All of those things require that we can identify this person and that this person can identify themselves, um, as well as identifying the organization and the entities and the practitioners along the way. Um, in terms of making this, uh, I think, more real, perhaps, uh, for, for some of the folks inside of government, um, I would say that we really need to close the chasm of what identity is and what identity does. So when we're talking about identifying someone in order to get them the vaccine and do that tracking that needs to be done to deliver the vaccine and know where and how to distribute it, that's an identity issue. Knowing that the vaccine actually came from the company, that's an identity issue. Um, but that said, when we're able to solve those baseline identity verification problems, well, you know, if you think about um, next gen pay, if you think about CERB delivery benefits, if you think about um, modernization of pension delivery, all of these initiatives and projects at the federal um, level all benefit from that same architecture, that same capabilities for solving digital identity. So what's so important here is that if we're able to solve the identity verification piece in the, um, in the COVID context, um, we're able to then draw that out into so many other initiatives because identity really is at the root foundation of any transaction that has value, that has risk, and actually does matter to people, whether that's personally or whether that's as um, an employee acting on behalf of, of some organization that they might work for. Thanks, Joni. Debbie, same type of question. You're you're in the elevator with the prime minister and the and the minister of finance. We've got the thirty second pitch as to why this should be a priority. What what do you think it is? I don't I don't even think it's a, a should we. I think it's a how do we. I mean, the reality of of our existence today is we are reliant um, on 
uh, communicating, engaging. This is a perfect example of that uh, digitally. And so to do that, to touch on all of the points that Joni just mentioned, whether it be uh, supply chain management, whether it be um, health management, whether it be education and how we're going to set up the future of our education system so that um, we are building the leaders of the future and to enable business um, to grow. And of course, our economy relies on small to medium businesses. That's the backbone of our economy. And these businesses need to be able to work. They need to be able to conduct their business and engage with Canadians across the country. So my elevator pitch, it should be, uh, how do we do this? And we're back to there. What's the, pl what's the plan to move this forward? How do we engage public and private sector entities? And what's the path for us to be able to um, allow our provincial and federal governments to work together with the private sector to get this in market. Thanks, Debbie. Um, and and Andre, your your, tech, your ten second pitch. Why why senior senior ministers officials should be paying uh, attention to this issue? And you might be on mute, Andre. Thanks. Sorry about that. Yes, thanks. The short answer is the problem with the digital identity infrastructure we have today is that it's easy for crooks and it's hard for all of us. And if we want to move this file forward, we've got to find to make it easy for all of us and hard for the crooks. So that's actually the really short answer. The challenge we have in times of COVID is that we're pushing more and more stuff online, which increases the amount of security required. The challenge is that users can't keep up with all these new security requirements and they're getting lost in the shuffle, which is actually increasing the attack service or the risks that we face in online service delivery. So if we wanna make this better to have a true digital economy, we need to have good digital identity. What good digital identity has is, is something that's simple for Canadians to use. It's accepted everywhere I go and it's trustworthy and cost-effective for business. And most importantly, it's not something crooks can use. The challenge we have today is with the crooks have my data or your data, they can be online as you in 10 seconds pretending to be you. When we have good uh, digital identity, they won't be able to do that anymore. Thanks, Andre. Now, Colleen, on the same theme, but you're coming from a province. So why is it important and why is it important for the, for the federal government and, and provinces to be working together in this space? Well, I guess I'd probably use an analogy um, can you honestly imagine operating today without a debit card or a visa card? I mean, how many of us are even carrying cash because of the pandemic and cash not even being accepted in many areas? So some of these quick pivots have caused us to push things online faster, as Andre said, and Joni and Debbie, it's critical um, to a lot of the transactions that we have to do at a distance, but we don't have the tools in place. We don't have the visa card uh, that allows us to access all these services in a trusted way. And chip and pin is certainly uh, part of what has solidified and protected and increased security and privacy. So to me, it's as simple as saying, you know, usernames and passwords don't work. Uh, every day you open up the news and you say uh, Facebook's been hacked or, or some other service uh, that we all use. Uh, um, and, you know, we know we need to do better. And it's this stacking of proofs of identity of who Colleen is. Uh, that can spot ab abnormalities and and in the physical world, you know, maybe my husband, I'll use Alan Foster from uh, Forge Rocks analogy. He says, uh, you know, honey, you're not feeling well today. That's what your husband would say. You're not acting like you normally would. And that's what happens online when we stack proofs of identity and patterns go out of whack, as Andre said, you can identify quicker, faster, sooner uh, that things are going awry and get them off. And that's really, really important in this new world where as we move services online, things uh, move faster and faster. So we need some mechanism and we don't have it today. We don't have that visa card that allows us to access services and digital identity really is like a visa card. Thanks, Colleen. Um, Colleen, actually, in, in your remarks, you spoke about visiting Estonia. Um, I visited them as well, as well as other countries who've made who've done uh, good things around digital identity, like Belgium and Denmark and others. 
this is sort of a, a lightning round because I, I want to get uh, to audience questions and, and a reminder that people can submit their questions through WooClap and Gen12 as the code. Um, but maybe right back to you, Colleen. Um, have we fallen behind in sort of a lightning answer between uh, compared to, to other countries in building a digital identity uh, infrastructure for, for Canada? And, and if so, um, are there specific causes that you can think of which, which we may have fallen behind? Yeah, um, New Brunswick did, uh, as I mentioned, uh, visit Estonia. It was a multi-party approach, uh, which is a rare uh, situation because we recognized early on that it, uh, any initiatives around digital had to sustain themselves uh, beyond any particular four-year period or party in power. Um, so political support was really critical. In Estonia, again, they had the benefit of starting from scratch. Um, because they had broken off from the Soviet Union and uh, the EU actually provided uh, additional funding for them to get their infrastructure in, in place. So they are the poster child uh, for uh, the digital economy. Having said that, uh, they also did some work on uh, laws around privacy. So no curious poking around or, you know, the laws say very clearly uh, you can't do that and you will be, uh, there will be se severe repercussions. Um, I think our laws need teeth. I think we need to work on the policy and I showed you that slide on the gap. Um, the policy work is tough. It is complex and requires a lot of stakeholders. Uh, none of that is easy and the political will is really critical. Uh, but at the end of the day, each of our uh, folks on the line today are in different business units and it still results back, or, um, it still uh, is in, uh, incredibly important for us to understand that standing up digital uh, identity is not the be all end all. It is the tool or the visa card. And if I can't access anything online or do services online, it really, uh, it's useless to me. So each of the folks online are in different departments. They need to be looking at business cases uh, where maybe they're not delivering the top level, level value to their clientele and how they can look at uh, what a roadmap might look like because uh, uh, to improve it, we, we just don't have the benefit of a, you know, a huge check coming our way. We need to take a proactive, systematic, overtime approach to um, moving um, uh, increased uh, services and efficiencies forward in our individual jurisdictions. Thanks, Colleen. All right, I'm gonna go uh, Andre, Debbie, and Joni uh, to, to close us off on this one. Um, lightning round, are we behind? And if so, if so, why, Andre? Yeah, I wanna share a picture here. This is my brother-in-law, Eric, and he's an industrial mechanic. So he does all of the HVAC systems for the hospitals in Toronto, and he actually does the CN Tower too. He's holding, his COVID certificate, a piece of paper that Ontario gave him. Now he's very grateful to get his COVID vaccination, but they've given him a piece of paper. So how is this meant to work? He's gonna go show up at a hospital. Now the problem is the security guard at the hospital needs to understand, is this guy really Eric Spademan? And is this piece of paper real? So this is the same kind of thing we're seeing at every service counter. How do we rely on the information that's being presented, particularly in the digital economy? This is the challenge that we face and it's the challenge of our time. We need to do this in a way that's simple for the person to present it and the receiver to be able to rely on the result and to do it digitally and in person. Debbie, same question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is actually about political will. So I think, you know, are, are we behind? We're marginally behind some countries. We're certainly behind countries like Estonia that took uh, the bold step to create a clean piece of paper and, and, and approach the world of ID and engagement uh, from a digital perspective. But I think in Canada, we actually have um, a majority of the elements needed. You can tell by, you know, uh, the energetic conversation today. These conversations have been underway for many years. Um, the organizations like DIAC, like the CIO Strategy Council, like Identity North, have um, energetic conversations with people who are 
eager to move this forward. So I think this is about how do we actually corral all of those elements, the public, the private sector, the policy, as, as Colleen mentioned, and use the analogy of, you know, when Canada moved to chip and pin a number of years ago, it wasn't just standards um, that was necessary. It was an ecosystem that was working together to progress a a roadmap to deliver the capabilities to the market. And I think the time is, is perfect for us to do that, but it actually needs, it needs some teeth, as Colleen said, it needs political will um, to pull the various players across the public and private sectors together. And together, I am confident that, you know, over a number of years, we can actually start to become leaders in the marketplace. Thanks, Debbie. So, Joni, you've got a, a national organization that, that is playing a leadership role in this space. Uh, is Canada behind when you look at your at your international competitors? Yeah, I think I think so much. Uh, I re I really uh, agree with um, all the panelists, and especially with uh, Debbie just said, and that we need the political will, um, and that we do have, um, you know, and talking about the energy that's there. Um, when I first came to the DIAC, we had about thirty members, and now we're at about ninety members, um, of, of which the panelists here are sitting on our board of directors, all of whom who have believed since at least two thousand fifteen, if not before, that a significant and sustained investment was necessary and a collaboration. It's more than standards. It's more than solutions. It's a full collaboration and the political will that's required. Now, to answer the question, um, or is, is Canada behind? I think you have to say, behind in what? Um, I, I, if we're talking about the specific implementation of actually being out there with our digital identities on our phones through mobile, through in-person and mobile, we're behind on that. We absolutely are, and we need to move forward. Um, if you talk about the commitment and the and the clarity of the vision that this only works when public and private come together that people don't live in a I worked, I transact with government only bubble and they don't live in an I transact with the bank only bubble. They 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 have a wealth of transactions um, and, and that if we wanna get security right, we have to do it as an ecosystem. If we wanna get privacy right, we have to do it as an ecosystem, public and private. That space, we are ahead, we are the visionaries. And in that space, organizations from around the world have been looking at us and, and pulling from our DNA around how to get the public and the private it to the same table. We have this moment, and if we don't act on it, though, we will be behind in that side as well. So we've got a mix there behind an implementation, way ahead on vision, and now is the time to act and really put it into action and um, solve this for Canadians. Thanks, Joni. So I'm, I'm moving to questions from the audience right now. Um, feel free if you want to take a, a first question. Uh, crack at the question just to lift your hand and I'll turn to you. Uh, the, our first two questions are, are linked. Uh, the question is, what are the best measures, practices to ensure privacy is considered and protected when developing and rolling out digital identity? So, so a privacy uh, angle. And then relatedly, knowing that governments and banks have been hacked and people's information stolen, uh, how can we ever completely uh, trust in anyone's ability to protect our personal data? So a combination of privacy and security concerns uh, and how do we address them in digital context and with digital identity? Anybody want to take a first crack at this one? If not, I may just turn to Andre to, to provide us uh, some, some insights first in this space. Yeah, I've touched on this point already. Uh, one of the challenges is today is the way identity works online is um, we ask a lot of questions. And this is manifestly the wrong approach for a couple of reasons. One is you're putting me, the real user, the, through an interrogation. And I get a little bit indignant when you don't believe it's me. But the reason services are asking me so many questions is because they want to get a high level of confidence of really me. And the way to do that is ask me lots of questions. And after I've gotten through enough information, you'll have enough confidence it's really me. The challenge at the back of that process is you have all my data. And now you are a target and a breach risk yourself. So what we need to do is find a way to do this without creating big honeypots of data, which is what we're doing online today. And if we can get to a place where we can trust a smaller set of information, but know it's reliable, we won't have to gather all the data. So first, it'll be easier for the user to accomplish. 
Two, you'll be able to trust the result. Three, you won't have all the data. And so then you don't become a breach risk yourself. And most importantly, where we need to get to is making sure that having possession of a user data alone is not sufficient to masquerade in, them in, in a transaction. So we need to get beyond asking questions and gathering information as a means to get confidence. We need to get to something only real users could possess, like a cell phone and a digital uh, passport or driver's license. Only one is in service at a time. That will solve this problem. And I think I'd, I'd like to build on that too, if, if I may, Francis. Um, I think we also need to um, kind of move away from relying, putting our whole ecosystem based on, on um, the authenticity of some analog documents. Um, you know, so, so we can build some beautiful firewalls um, around various different systems, but if we are relying on a laminated piece of plastic to authenticate who we are, um, already we are we, we're at risk. Um, so I think that kind of uh, digitization of those you know foundational attributes, the things that we we use to get the documents that prove we are who we say we are. So things like our birth certificate and our passports, etc. If those are digitized, and then we can use those to get further documentation and credentials, then it helps actually. Uh, create a much more robust ecosystem and using some of the technology that frankly, you know, some of the nefarious actors are using um, might help too. So it's very, it's very hard for us to, to kind of plug a hole when we're still, you know, basing the whole system on, um, as I say, an analog process. Thanks, Debbie. I'm going to get to the next question, but then I'm going to uh, ask... Uh... Francis, if I might just jump in before you move on. I think it's really important to understand what we've just expressed in terms of digitization. So I'll use a common example that many folks have rented an Airbnb. They're scanning a copy of their driver's license and sending it online to Airbnb to prove who they are. That's a form of digitization, but it's not what we're talking about. We're talking about getting a proof that I, as a citizen of New Brunswick, own a driver's license and sending that from an authoritative source, which is only government, through a channel to a third party like Airbnb uh, to prove I am who I say I am. Now, I'm not going to send my entire driver's license. I'm going to only send the minimum required. So it would be a proof. It might only be a checkbox that says Colleen has a driver's license. And so you think about privacy by design from the beginning of all of these analog processes and what does true digital mean, not scanning, not making a copy of what's already in play in the paper-based world. So I, I really want to make that distinction before we move on. Passports would be no different. Just because you scan it doesn't make it an e-passport. <laughs> so I think, I think the other thing is two people lean on driver's license because that's the only thing we have and that's the only thing we know. And driver's license is not defined as an identity document. But when somebody says, bring your government issued ID, we all pull out our driver's license. License, right um, in this ecosystem that we're talking about it, it, when I think acceptance is important here too and so we're thinking about what do we require what does Airbnb really require they say driver's license because that's the easy one if also they might be able to get a proof from your bank that you bank with that you actually have an account that you bank with this bank that you've you pay your bills <laughs> I mean they, they really want to be able to pay your, their bills and identify you so they could also say Okay, we want we would accept a digital proof of your driver's license. We would accept a digital proof that you are a financial institution customer, you know, signed by that financial institution. So there could be more than one way to 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 fulfill that requirement. But all we have right now is driver's license, so that's what we do. Thanks, Joni. So recognizing we have I think three minutes left to the to to the session, I'd actually go right back to you, um, Joni, with with a question. And people, uh, if they want to add in, just lift your hand and final quick comments. Um, Joni, the one of the questions we have from our audience me members is, how long realistically will it take before digital identity has a tangible impact on the lives of Canadians? When will we? When will they do a large majority of their transaction via apps or mobile? Digital identity has a large impact on you now. 
<laughs> so, you know, you're, you're already feeling that impact, whether it's, uh, you know, being able to do something new remotely, which might have come from COVID. I'm certainly finding doctors are much more receptive and able to see you remotely now than they were in the past. Um, but uh, but uh, the lack of it, you're definitely feeling the lack of it and the user IDs and passwords that you have to manage and the things that you can't do without going online. My, um, I have a family member who had COVID. She's having a hard time paying her bills. Nobody can come visit her to bring her the checkbook. She can't find anything. And the bank says, well, come in to see us. And that's not a solution, you know, especially with somebody who's getting over COVID. So you're feeling it now. Um, we do have, there are networks that are in the ecosystem now. There are solutions that are in the ecosystem now. Andre talked about the Verified Me solution. Debbie talked about a network of networks, you know, leveraging existing capabilities. So there are pieces of the puzzle that are here now. Um, I think that uh, we will see more and more of that accelerated over this next year. I know there are some federal departments that have committed to new digital identity systems and solutions before the end of 2021. So, so I think we're just going to see incremental adoption and, and innovation using trusted technology that we've worked with over the next year uh, to three, and that will continue on forward. Thank you so much. So that actually, I think, is, is a great note to, to finish on. That was uh, that brings us to time. Uh, I really do want to thank all of you, Joni, Debbie, Andre, and Colleen, uh, for the conversation. I'm sure we could actually keep uh, talking about this for a while because it is it is a fascinating and important topic, and it is about the government stepping into the 21st century. Um, I'd like to invite our viewers to register for the next event in the New Economy series on Tuesday, February 16th. Uh, the event is on Winner Takes Most Economics. Uh, and competition policy in the new economy. So, so another great topic from the Canada School and what's sure to be an interesting session. Uh, thank you again to all our speakers and thank you to all of you for joining us today uh, to discuss this. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it.